the Alsace class. Probably one of the most interesting evolutions you can ever see taking place. You see, the French Navy, they are... Well, if any Navy's more wrecked by the interwar years than the French Navy, I'm not sure which it is. You see, the Germans are wrecked by the Treaty of Versailles. The French, you can say, suffer the same thanks to the na various naval treaties. But it's not the naval treaties that really wreck them. It's their governments. The Dutch suffer from a problem in that whenever they look for a new ship, whenever they want to build a new ship, and especially a capital ship of any kind, they spend so much time debating, so much time arguing, so much time considering all the various options, that usually by the time they start to order it, the war they'd been hoping to deter by having it breaks out and swallows them. Eva engulfs them and surrounds them in conflict so much so that they can't order them. Because they can't build them themselves and they can't get the components they need because the countries which can are involved in fighting the war. Or... Well... In World War Two, they get rolled over. They fight, but they get rolled. They resist, but they were rolled. The French... The French, under the treaty system, allow them to be trapped in the cells to be trapped in a no-win scenario, where they are limited to the same size fleet as the Italian fleet, and therefore, as long as the Italians are an aggressor, they cannot defend their empire because they have exactly the same strength as the Italians. They have no superiority. And you can say, well, you know, surely with the various. I was they could hold off. Maybe they could, you know, uh, spare some battleships to go off elsewhere, whilst um, they defend, uh, whilst they use the remainder, the majority to deter the Italians. Trouble is, the French can't afford to deter the Italians. They have to combat the Italians in Mediterranean because they have their own empire in North Africa, on the border of the Italian Empire in North Africa, which means. There are both of them are going to be needing to protect and interdict convoys going backwards and forwards across the Mediterranean. Ouch. The Italians... Well, the Italians have the uh, lovely straits around Sicily to funnel people. Uh, in the centre of the Mediterranean, they can bring their supplies down to avoid the French. As long as they're not also fighting the British. As long as they don't also have to deal with the British as a threat fighting in the eastern basin of the Mediterranean, the Italians can pretty much sh funnel all their supplies behind. So the French are stuck. The French can hope that if they find themselves in a war with the Italians, the British will join in, but then, frankly, their battle fleet doesn't matter. Because if it's an Anglo-Italian war, the Italians find themselves outnumbered by about two to one. If the French are there, that's great. It's three to one. And that's not even with the British bringing in all their capital ships. That's the reality for most of the 1920s and 30s. That's the scenario you've got. If the British don't join a war, then the French have got a naval stalemate, a kind of 
floating liquidy version of the Western Front from World War One in the Mediterranean to deal with. If the British are involved, they curb stomp the Italians because of the sheer quantity of force that can be used. Neither provides a good rationale for investment in your navy, does it? By treaty, they're limited to the same limitation, same as you. So therefore, they can't do anything. And usually the best example to highlight this is the burn. It is a quintessentially French design in that it's full of exceptionally interesting ideas on paper. Exceptionally interesting ideas on paper. The trouble is, when you actually implement those ideas, there are issues. First idea, individual lifts for every type of aircraft. Now that sounds great. Right into the thing of the problem of, well, hang on. That means you basically have one lift for your strike aircraft. You have one lift for your scout aircraft. You have one lift for your fighters. And whilst you can theoretically move them around, we can all go, oh, you could use the fighter from any of the lifts. Uh, there's going to be the small issue that the hangar is going to be full of the aircraft parked and organized in sections, which means in practice they're going to be individual. And then you've got lifts which have, some of them which have roofs which come up. So when they come up on deck, they block the flight deck. You can't land or take off because there is that. Yeah. That's the burn. But truly, truly, if I want to really show the problem with the French construction program, I start off with a design process of how they get from the Dunkirks to the Alsaces. And the thing is, with the Rickaloos in between and, don't forget Gascoigne, the thing is, None of them are bad designs. That's the point. None of them are bad designs. But you can tell what is the battleship the French Navy really wanted to get. And you can tell the battleship it was forced to get by treaty. And you can tell from their construction designs the compromises they are trying to make while they deal with the internal political issues to get through. Another example I would give a shout out is these ships. The British, the Royal Navy, would have loved the twin 4.5 inch upper deck gun to have been ready. It wasn't in time. And they would have loved to have had them ready for the battle class, but they didn't. So they needed a battle class, so they had to use the weapon systems, the between deck gun systems, which would normally come from capital ships, which slowed down carrier construction. But they were important. They needed the destroyers. And then we have the tribal class. Theoretically, not the smallest of the three designs. But think about this. If you'd asked Admiral Henderson what he really would have wanted when he was building these ships, what he really envisaged, he'd probably be in a tribal class, something in a tribal class layout with four twin upper deck 4.5 inch guns, the two sets of torpedo launchers that the Daring class has, and all the 40 millimeters that the battle class has. So it'd be a truly all-round, all-purpose destroyer. But that wasn't allowed under the treaty system. And he couldn't necessarily build enough of those to do what he needed to do with them. It would also probably, <laughs> definitely would have counted probably as a small cruiser in many of the KBLD stands. So what's the difference with the French 
battleships. Why am I talking about raw navy destroyer development when I'm talking about French battleships? Well, the Dunkirks, the Riculous, they get their own videos. Gascoigne here doesn't. Gascoigne is what happens is uh, when you take a Riculou design and you go, hmm, I can play around with this. And instead of having both guns forward, you, uh, both turrets forward, you have one aft, one forward, and so it, it can cover the rear, it can cover firing back. And you sort out all sorts of things to do with the aviation. It's, it's just an excellent idea of what to do. It's not really, though, is it? Let's be honest, if you're going for an all-forward ar arrangement, it makes sense. If you're going for a distributed arrangement, basically you've gone for the same problem as the Deutschen class. Yes, you have firepower. But at no point do you have maximal firepower until you're broad beamed onto someone. At which point they probably have equivalent firepower, if not superior to you. And that's a problem. Because if you've got it all forward, you can attack at an angle where you make up the smallest, smallest image, really. Smaller, presenting them with the narrowest profile of yourself against their maximum profile. Because they have to turn broad beamed onto you to fire all their guns. So this is the Gascoigne class. It's the halfway point. It's also the starting point for the Alsace class. It really is. There are things they consider about them. There are things they want to work through them. But the starting point is Gascoigne. It is this vessel. And the ideas which we developed for it. There is nothing wrong with its capabilities on paper. There really isn't. But, it's also not really up to what it needs to be. It's not really there for what you need it to be. The Dunkirks, smaller guns, but a more capable arrangement probably. The same, definitely the same the Riccolus. So why do the Gascoigne? Why do it this way? Why design it this way? Because the French are starting to worry about their battle line. They're starting to worry that they're falling behind. And because, honestly, they're making a virtue of the quadruple turret. They are really impassioned with the quadruple turret and its ability to say. Now, it's been something which has come up in the French construction for a long time by this point. The quadruple turret. And... Ultimately, the French had reached the point of understanding volume of fire mattered in ranging earlier than the British. And unlike the British, who of course had the experience of, well, the experience of Jutland especially, where turning modern weapons into maximal fire speed as you can with weaponry by... Ignoring all, and ignoring the safety concerns and the limitations, and the actual system you yourself have built into your ships to prevent them going boom, in order to more rapidly fire guns, doesn't help. So you need to find a way of maximizing the rapidity of your fire and the volume of fire, without at the same time compromising. It's an important one, compromising your own systems. But still, it's always good to have a test and well, let's go to the first UAD of this video. So, welcome to the Gascoigne, or as close as I can build it. And well, she's rather pretty I think actually. I do like the lines of these French ships, it's just... I do not think this is a good 
survivability ratio. I would say... Well, it's always got a chance. I have picked out a threat which has the exact same number of 15-inch guns as she does. This is, of course, one of our traditional testers on this game. Uh, the Prince Leopold. The... I think it's Prince Leopold. It's one of the... It's one of my... Um, Bismarck, Tirpitz, uh, Approximates. It seems to be a balanced uh, uh, threat to you have. And this is the Gascoigne Stanite, the Severante. She's a nice ship. But two quad turrets. She has the same broadside. She could win this, in theory. In practice, I'm doubtful. There's a few reasons for that. Um, simple the qualification. The um, Reality is that with two quad turrets, any a single turret gets damaged, she's down 50% of her firepower. With the German vessel, a single turret gets damaged, they're down 25% of their firepower. There's also the fact that as a rule, twin turrets tend to have a slightly higher rate of fire per gun than quad turrets. Uh, triple turrets do not suffer as much, but the complication of the uh, the quad turret does make the life difficulty. Even when you're de facto dealing with almost two twin turrets in each quad turret. But those twin turrets are crowned together. But she's doing okay. Not sure what just hit her, the, lost her half of structural integrity, but something big it hit. What is hitting you? Where is it hitting you? Seems to be hammering part of her. But she tried. She did try. In many ways, this design and the others which preceded it, the Dunkirks and the remainder of the Riculo class, they are products of France's existing infrastructure. They're products of France trying to build within. They're products of France almost trying to get a buy with the bare minimum. And the bare minimum wasn't enough. And it's realized during the Alsace. Honestly, the Alsace designs, they are... They're talking about infrastructure. They're planning on building infrastructure. They're planning whole new graving docks. They're planning whole new upgrades to existing dry docks. But there are problems with design. I would say that the French are, by the treaty system, have shackled themselves to Britain. Because, as I've already discussed, the treaty system meant that they couldn't beat Italy, because they were equal to Italy in the Mediterranean. And in terms of their strength, they were matched. And 
the French had a whole massive empire to protect. And so without Britain, they couldn't do either of those missions. Which is an issue from them, because it means they are shackled to the British decision-making process. When the British want to build ships smaller than the treaties, and are trying to push the treaties smaller because the politicians in Britain have a bright idea. They always have bright ideas. It's quite disturbing how often they have bright ideas. The French go down that route. Eventually they end up with the Dunkirks, which are the beginning of the process. Dunkirks, of course, are these lovely ships with 13-inch guns. The Ricculars have 15-inch guns. The French are in trouble, and they realise it. They realise that the Italians have got an edge on them. The Germans are getting an edge on them. They should have the edge over, well, at least the Germans. After all, they've had a fleet in the interwar period. But they haven't funded their infrastructure. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's hard to justify a navy when you've managed to stick yourself in a strategic... Honestly... A strategic vortex and you just can't get out of it anywhere you go you're gonna get blown to pieces but this is this the French working through it and there are various options they put together there are various options there is this which plan, which you know is largely taken from um, John Jordan's book, French Battleships. Hang on, no, it's not just John Jordan. Robert Dumas and John Jordan. Um, their book published in, I think it's 2010, roughly. It's, I took it out of it a long time ago. <laughs> I've had this table translated for a long, long time. And even put like this, because I can expand it out. And then, I know it's on its side, but you can read it quite clearly. And I actually find it nice that way, because <clears throat> it allows you to read it down and think about the various capabilities and compare them. In a way, if it was the other way angled round, you couldn't. Or you might not. And you really do learn quite quickly that the number three design... That's the big, powerful design. That's the one with 12, 15-inch guns. Three quad turrets. Now think about that. 32 knots of speed... Fairly decent armour. We'll go for fairly decent armour. The belt's 13.8 inches. It could be better, but, you know, it's not bad. And 12 15 inch guns. Twelve fifteen inch guns. about the rate of fire, the volume of fire they could put down. Broadside, that's scary. Head on. That's the eight 15-inch guns of the Ricculars. So they say I have the same forward fire. So if you have the three Ricculars and you have the two Alsaces in a group together, that's a lot of firepower heading your way. Add in, well, add in the gas going. Mm, it's not as much help on forward firing, but it does increase three turrets carrying, covering the uh, the uh, the rear. Dunkirk's they're a bit slow in comparison. Twenty nine and a half knots. 
but 432 knot shift, uh, well, including Gascoigne, 632 knot shift. That's a capable force. That is a capable force. And, let's be honest, their primary things which they're worried about are not the German ships. The German Navy, if it's going for France, has to run into this rather large roadblock known as Britain first. And that is the French strategic criteria. No matter that the Germans are a far easier thing to motivate their nation around, to hold up as a threat and go, we have to build up. The real threat is Italy. And let's be honest, 12 versus 8 15 inch guns. That's an advantage. And that's going to have an impact. In many ways, I would say the Alsace is a better fit for the Royal Navy in terms of its armament than necessarily the King George V's. The quad 15 inch guns. Because an improved 15 inch gun and quad turrets would have been quite a nice thing for the Royal Navy to have. If King George V's had looked like this with King George V level armour People might have a very different opinion of them. But as said, King George V were originally hoped to have 12, 14 inch guns. It's that volume of fire factor coming back again. Can you have a few shell, a few larger shells, which can possibly get the necessary hits? If they do hit, they're going to cause a lot more damage. But it's you've, you're firing less shells per salvo. You're flying salvos slower. You're firing all sorts of things which are disadvantages mathematically. Are you getting necessary hits, or is it better to fire more smaller shells? The Royal Navy looked into it. Well, maybe you decided with cruisers it was better to go 6 inch over 8 inch because of the rate of fire and the likely engagement range. But there again, the Royal Navy is also going with 9 16 inch guns for the, for the Lion class. And 9 guns was the choice for the G3s and the N3s. Nine guns was the choice for Nelson and Rodney. The point is, it's always a compromise. It's always a case of balancing your needs with what your strategic priorities and your operational priorities are. Having a ship whose forward firing is the same, qual uh, same quantity as the broadside firing of its likely opponent is an advantage. Having a cumulative broadside which is 50% greater is an advantage. If you think you might be dealing with things which are going to be bigger and tougher, then maybe you need the bigger and tougher guns. But you still probably need a quantity of them. There is a reason the HMS Dreadnought I put into the video discussion about what the Royal Navy might have built in response to the Yamato class. And if they learned about the Yamato class, what they might have ordered is a 16 16 gun ship. Because that would be the volume of fire and the necessary firepower to get the hit. 
but it'd also be a very big, very powerful ship. A very, very big and very powerful ship. But really, it's only fair now if we test the Alsace, which I have marketed as a Super Dunkirk, because honestly, I consider the Rickaloo's Evolved Dunkirks, and then I consider the Alsace's Super Dunkirks. Only be fair if we test the Alsace design against the same design which earlier was so cruel to the Gascoigne imitation. So cruel. So, we have a battle, and here we have what happens if the uh, lovely French Gloire de Lorraine, instead of Alsace de Lorraine, managed to find a German surface radar. Now, they, I've basically taken the Gascoigne design and I have made it slightly beamier to accommodate the 6-inch guns going on the beams and added an extra quad turret. So, that is all I've done here. This is going to be interesting. Let's see what happens. I have to admit, I am going to... Um, stick them into normal myself so they're not quite so close together and let's see what happens now why am I doing a 2v1 scenario well because honestly this is what the French were thinking like uh, with their so when their forces they were often thinking about deploying their vessels in pairs or twos and threes and let's be honest, if you've got a squadron of three assigned to an area, the odds are you're going to have two available. Or rather, one able, one at one maybe at sea, or uh, within close time being put to sea, and one that probably is going to be about, uh, probably can be sent to back it up. The other one will probably be a maintenance. And even ships. So you assign three to something. You've really got two. And that's only most of the time. Sometimes you only have one. This is why you need four. Guarantee one at sea and one available to go to sea should you need to replace the one that's at sea. Now, one thing I will say is that UAD seems to have done something to the, um, the quads. Yeah, the French quads have been made incredibly susceptible to enemy fire, and um, have also been made less accurate, I swear. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, the same stats can be programmed in with the British quads, with the American quads, and you have no trouble. The French quads, there's a real, look at this, there are... In this case, there are 20 shells coming from two battleships, flinging through the air towards them, and not a single one hits. And all three ships have radar on them, and yet conversely, in the case of the German ship, almost every broadside of eight it fires, something is at all, and is yet barely managing to hit. And this is the problem with simulation sometimes. And another reason, again, why I don't do the Italian uh, do the Italians the simulation on this game is that, that the Italian ships, apart from the debates you get into, there are issues. Now, myself, I would say. This is a very good, very capable design, and I would say the French quads, their turret design is fairly decent, and they are f capable of fairly accurate firing. 
I'd also say that the German ships in this game are sometimes, for various reasons, seem to be credited as being almost super, super ships. The Lorraine is sinking. Well, they did get a lucky shot and blow it up. And I will add something else here. There was a question recently given to me about why do I tend to make the barbette strong on this chat on this um, uh, on UAD, and why do I tend to put it into weight now, even though I'm putting weight into the belt? Because I found that if whatever I give in terms of barbette strength seems to be the strength given to this area, and if I make it too weak. It just makes it a um, constant thing that blows up in very shortly. Oh, that's a lot of fire. Well, Gloire, as you can see, is going along fighting away very bravely. Honestly, who sinks who first is up for a running debate. They have both managed to wreck each other. Realistic history, if you were talking about real life, and you were going with a 12-15 inch gun ship versus an 8-15 inch gun ship, you would A, not be closing to this range, and B, probably uh, would have overwhelmed them a bit earlier than this because sheer volume of fire stacks up. And they are now less than six kilometers away from each other. But that's the Gloire. That is the Lorraine class on here. The Alsace class, their model. Now, the often quoted thing for these ships is that they were built to respond to the German construction of the H-Class. Honestly, as I've said, it's more a response to the Italians than the Germans. Yes! They would have been useful additions. Yes, the Royal Navy would not have complained about having their firepower with them to deal with any German threats coming out of the North Sea, but if the French found themselves fighting the Germans without the Royal Navy, they were in a lot of problems. But they still had a marked advantage, a marked advantage in numbers of ships. You have to remember that that's a key thing to think about in World War II. Uh, the German Navy is never that large. Especially not in surface ships. Yes, they build up a huge number of submarines as the war goes on. But at the beginning, they've got barely 50 in service. And in terms of their capital ships, they start off World War II with the Scharnhorst and Eisenhower. They bring Bismarck into service. They bring Turbots into service. They lose Bismarck. They lose Neisenau to going to getting her guns replaced. Scharnhorst gets lost in the Battle of the North Cape. So in reality, the Germans very rarely have more than one, if or maybe two, capital ships op able to operate at any one time. The French usually have three or four capable of operating at any one time. That's one of the reasons why in that video I've got two versus one. Because that's what I think would have happened. I think the French would have had more. The French did have more infrastructure to start from and begin with. Yes, they were investing to build and support these, but they were investing to build and support these, and that's one of the things which makes me think that they would not have stopped with two. Honestly, I could see this class having been made to a group of four. Maybe with another one played around with, like Gasc uh, Gascoigne had been played around with in the Ricolas. There could ultimately be one made which has four quad turrets. 
ultimately will be an interesting vessel to see, will be a capability to consider. These ships were about France finding itself again as a global naval power. But they were still trapped in that scenario with Italy. And the 1920s and 30s, they haven't, hadn't been able to invest in the infrastructure necessary to be able to quickly get out of that trap. The thing is, France actually has more infrastructure and more ability to build than Italy. They do. But Italy has, how do I put this, more investment. They've made more investment of it. Yes, that's been an offshoot of a fascisty uh, led government. And Considering, as I've talked about before with Mussolini, the uh, sheer number of people, and this was in the Washington uh, governments, of the, uh, governments of the Washington Treaty video I talked about especially, the sheer number of people who in Parliament basically spent their entire time, while Mussolini was a dictator, slagging him off, almost every day Parliament was in session. You could say that's window dressing for a dictatorship, but doesn't exactly ring true for making it a strong dictatorship, does it? Would they have worked? Yes, they would have. Then, as I've said before, they would have been very interesting ships. Uh, I think... I think the French could have done better. But I don't think they could also have done a lot worse. And I think if World War II had held off for even three, four years, 1944, 1945, these would be in service. These would have been in service. And they would have been capable. And the thing is, I, you are more likely to see D's entering service and successes entering service than you are to see H class or the Soviet, the Sovetsky Soyuz class entering service in that space of time. Because France actually has the capacity to build the ships. When they actually make a decision, kind of like the Dutch, and they do put their minds to it, they can build the ships. The yards are going to do their best to build their own individual version of whatever design they're supposed to be building, but they will build the ships. And they'll be good. Ooh, what have we got to come up? So many things. So many things, but this week, this week we've got to come up capital ships in the treaty era, where, of course, the Dunkirks are going to be part of it. The Torios. The Nelrods. Mm-hmm. Basically, King George V's also. It's going to be a comparison of working through them all and comparing how different nations were affected in their procurement by the treaties. Twenty ninth of August is billed as a viewer's suggestion. So I'm looking through the comments. And I'm deciding what I'm going to take as the viewer's suggestion. Uh, the last one was JDP 19's Learning Lessons from War. How navies go about the process of analyzing conflict and learning from it. So I'll be interested to hear what any of you think. And that's actually going to be today's question. A, learning from what would you like... Sorry, not learning lessons from war. Don't want to repeat that. I'm not going to repeat the comment. But um, what would you like as the viewer's suggestion? For a Tuesday video. Remember that's not a live. But. It's kind of the same as Log Patrol. And it's part of the year of technology. So it should broadly speaking. Fit within that theme. Right. Thanks very much for watching. 
I'm going to finish this now. But there is going to be another UAD section come after this. And in that section, it shows what happens when it was a solo Lorraine versus that German service radar. It had the same issues. The quad guns on UAD, and I didn't notice this when Gascon was in service, but I did notice this, that the quads in UAD today, with the latest update for French, uh, for the French fleet, seem to be performing very badly. I'm not sure what's going on with them, but there are issues with their accuracy. It's... In real life, they weren't that bad. They weren't easy, but they weren't that bad. But anyway, this is one of those video, uh, one of those recordings which I didn't use. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Right, this is going to be a very simple battle. It's going to be <clears throat> our 12 50 inch gun Lorraine. Looking rather spiffy. Basically, I've taken the Gascoigne design and I've made it slightly fatter. Being yeah. So the 6 inch guns could go down there because that made the most sense in terms of the UAD construct in making the equivalent. And replaced one of the six inch gun forward with a very nice 15 inch gun. We still have the 16 inch gun on the rear. You'll notice that I wasn't able to raise up a barbet to make that higher than this. Which I did find mildly distressing, but you know, it still fires. It still fires. And of course, we've got the four inch guns. Or rather, the 3.9 inch guns. She's a good looking ship. We wanted this to be stable for long range fire, so we'll take it down to 26 knots. Yes, I did apply a maximum speed of 32 knots, but yes, she hasn't got a 32 knot speed, maximum speed because of, well, construction issues, which is pretty darn accurate, let's be honest, for a most of the ships produced at the time. And in this scenario, she is out doing the lone battleship thing in the Bay of Biscay. And a lone German battleship turns up without any destroyers. Probably for the German reasons. They've probably been lost in Narvik or something like that. And so the battleships are going to bump into each other. Again, far more likely battle cruisers to bump into each other like this. But, you know. There is testing a design, and there is testing a combat philosophy, doctrine, or task force capability. If you're just comparing testing a design, sometimes a one-on-one -on -one tells you all you need to know. And that's what we're doing. We are testing this. One-on-one. -on -one. I have to say there is one thing, though, which um, it's worth our reason realizing here in this game. For some reason, the uh, French flag, especially, likes to disappear if you hold it at the right angle. Now, I'd say they're doing fairly well. They've managed to get some hits, but have the hits started to cause damage? Quads do have a slightly slower rate of fire than twins. They do. Don't be surprised. Even the French guns, which are basically two pair, uh, two pair rather than a quad, in their structuring and design, they're slightly slower. It's the complication. It's the effect of the firing of the guns. It does slow them down. Let's go see what our German cannon is looking like. And uh, they're looking fairly. Fairly untouched, honestly.
There is the theory, and then there is the fact that these German battleships do tend to turn out to be freaking super cheap. Oh, yep, yeah, she's out. Someone asked me recently why I put such heavy barbettes on my ships when I designed the new AD. It's because then, well, when they blow up like that, the rest of the ship doesn't sink. And also because, honestly, you can. It's one of the few things you can do to move the weight around on the ship. 